You gotta give me one thing. I'm a scary judge of talent. Washington back to back plays. The Detroit Pistons select Luke Kennard from Duke University. Welcome back, everybody. Thanksgiving week episode of the Triple Double Podcast. My name is Corey Albertson of Triple Double Prospects. We're joined by Jason Morrow of 270 Hoops as a producer. And today's guest is Coach Doug Davenport. Coach, what's going on? Hey, Corey. Good to be here, man. Just, you got a little break. Between individuals, practice, games, everything else, you know, you have a few minutes to hop on here with you. Well, you, you got a more exciting life than me, bro. Last um, <laughs> couple hours I spent watching an eighth grade basketball game. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I've, I've done that now twice in the last seven days, but I think I'm done with it now. But uh, there's a kid up here that's going to be really good. So I had to had to go get a look myself and have some fun with that. But <laughs> Let me. Uh, Where is he? What's his name? Let me get. Let me write that down. <laughs> oh yeah, for sure. Rayvon Griffith, Oiler High School. So, um, Oiler Junior High. So we'll see where he right. goes beyond that. So let me give everybody to run down real quick. Uh, Doug Davenport, veteran college coach, uh, third year on staff at his alma mater, Bellarmine University, uh, one of the top Division two programs in the country, consistently. 10 consecutive NCAA Division II tournament appearances. And before Bellarmine, Doug spent time on staffs at Eastern Kentucky, at Xavier, and at Louisville, where uh, he was part of the 2013 National Championship team for the Cardinals. Uh, is that the full report on Doug Davenport? That's both. I spent four days at Winthrop, too. Four days. Four days at Winthrop. Yeah, when and took the job down there. I, I went, uh, moved. I was actually uh, – me and, and Brian Thornton, who I know you know, me and BT, oh, yeah. we had gone down there. Everything was great. Uh, I think I moved, signed a lease and everything. I think I moved down on like a Thursday maybe, and I left on Monday. <laughs> it's a, hey, you got to do what you got to do. Hey, it's, what, it, I mean, it's a wild game. Brian Thornton wasn't leaving because there's great golf down there in the Carolinas. <laughs> hey, right hey they did speed. a good job. They've done a great job there. Oh, they've done it. I mean, Pat Kelsey's yeah. name is going to consistently be mentioned, you know, at high major. Every you know, job. Obviously in, he's, done, uh, he's done. He's such a good coach. Right, for sure. For sure. And then um, you're also an alum of um, Mick Cronin basketball camp where you and oh, I yeah. worked together in the yeah, summer yeah, when we were still teenagers. I'm going to tell you, Corey and I, we, we've known each other so long. He went from CTM, Corey the manager, to Corey the podcast host. And, and and everything in between. <laughs> Corey's done it all, man. Something like that. Something like that. Well, let's uh, let's get into it here. We're gonna talk a little uh, college basketball today. Talk a little bit coaching, coaching stories. Uh, you know, having done the high high level Division two thing at Bellarmine, and then having done high major Division one stuff and mid major Division one stuff, you've got a lot of perspective. And the first thing I want you to talk about is this: you are in the very small fraternity of people who not only did you play college basketball with your father as the head coach, but now you're an assistant in college basketball and your father's the head coach. Yeah. I wonder how many they'll only, I mean, I'm, I know there have to be several, I guess Tony Bennett's one, um, but Kevin Willard, who was kind of like my, my idol growing up when he was on staff with my dad at UofL and he played for his father, Ralph. Uh, well, I guess, no, I guess he never coached under Ralph. How about Pat Knight? Is he still coaching? Is Pat Knight? I don't know. He was well, Pat Knight. He, Pat Knight still is on the list, though. Right. Sure. Yeah. 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 He definitely be on the list. But it. Um, no. It, it's. It's such a. It's such a. Uh, I say unique, and I don't mean that in a bad way. It's such a unique profession, and it's a unique way to grow up. Um, you know, right now we have. Obviously, you all know C.J. Fleming, you know, who's on our roster. He played for his father in high school. We have a kid named Parker Chitty, who's another junior guard for us. Uh, he played for his father, Brent Chitty, at Columbus East, um, about halfway between Louisville and Indianapolis. And then we have another freshman, a kid named Garrett Tipton, whose father was a longtime high school football coach. So we've had 
you know, we've done well with tons of coaches. I think there's, I think with the way we do things, it's a very all encompassing program. Um, coaches sons, I think get it. It's not a culture shock. Um, they're two feet in on everything. It's very much a team first operation. Uh, I, it's something that's really, really worked for us. And, um, Parker, CJ, Garrett, all, I mean, to be honest with you, if you could coach 15 of those guys, like you coach till you're a hundred years old, they're easy. They're super, super easy to deal with. They understand there are times when things get heated in practice and games and voices are raised and some coaches even yell, my father, maybe even one of them. And, and they, I'll be honest with you, the, the, the more pressure packed, the more intense the situation gets, the harder they dig in and the more they perform. And, and I like to think that, that maybe their upbringing has something to do with it. Um, I don't know. I mean, I think when things got way out of control with me, I just threw the ball all over the gym. So maybe they're just wired differently than me. Right. I mean, you guys certainly have a style of player in terms of mentality. I mean, as well, skill set, but especially mentality type of kid that you guys recruit and, that's you know that's that's common in Division Two. It's one of the things we've talked about on this podcast, and certainly one of the reasons you guys have been successful. But when I look at your dad specifically, um, you know, being such a highly respected coach, having done it for so many years, I've seen that you know he's really started to give you some of the reins in terms of like recruiting. I remember in July this year, I was I was at some AAU game watching whoever, and I looked over and said, you know, Coach Davenport, who do you like? And um, he goes, this game. You'd have to ask Doug. He knows who we're recruiting, you know. So he's really, you know, <laughs> well, handing you well, different parts of it, and you know, you're getting more experience in different areas. That's yeah, great. Yeah, and and the truth is, I, I think with with all assistant coaches, no matter what else, and I think in basketball coaching, I think that as a, as a whole, I think our games had some problems because we've gone away from um, hiring guys who are um all in on the coaching and development when i say development i mean developing the kids as men uh we've gone away from that at some point but and i think that's very important for assistant coaches but at the end of the day my father has a full plate from running the program to if 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 you all i know you're not really louisville guys i can't tell you i bet he speaks to 150 groups a year that's every other day, and I'm, that may be conservative because there's a lot of days where he hits two, three different groups. Um, so ultimately, Bo, myself, Felton, we've got to we've got to do what we've got to do to identify the kid, go find the kid, develop a list. Um, to be honest with you, we don't cast a very wide net. Uh, we're very picky on who we recruit, uh, and like you said, mentality and attitude. Listen, they can be an inch too short. They might be not quite as athletic as you'd like. We want tough kids. We want kids who absolutely – the single most important thing for kids who succeed at, at, our, at our program and the ones who don't, number one, they have to love ball. Like, if you don't love ball – I tell every kid I recruit this. We really – we don't blow a lot of smoke in the recruiting process. We're very upfront and honest with the kids. Because if they don't like what they're hearing with us, that's fine. They're not going to like it when they're here. We got to get guys who, one, they have to love ball, like really be ate up with it. And number two, they got to want to be here. You got to want to be a part of the program. We, every single guy, and this is, a, this is a fun stat, my graduating class was the last class of four year kids that didn't play in the Final Four. Every single kid who's been here for four years that signed in 2007 or later has played in at least one Final Four. Understand it's not about you. It's about the team. It's about the program. It's about your teammates. We will never, ever, ever cower, cower down and just say, ah, oh, we're, you know, we're going all in on this guy. And the one thing I've learned, Corey, in, in coaching, when you start making exceptions and you start treating one guy different and you, you're, you're bending the rules for this one guy, you're indirectly. This year we have 17 on the roster. We've never had 17 on the roster, but we had a senior get hurt last year who redshirted. So we've got a big group. But if you start doing stuff to accommodate one guy, you're indirectly taken away from the other 16. And it's not fair to them. 
And so we're very upfront about how we do things. This is how you're expected to behave. This is how you're expected to, to behave academically. This is the expectations are very, very clearly outlined. Our guys are well, students. you, the, it sounds, it sounds very similar. I mean, we're talking about a different level of athletic talent compared to what, you know, coach Patino had at Louisville, sure. but you know, you, you grew up around that. Your dad Absolutely. was an assistant for Rick for a number of years. So you saw that. And then you went and worked in a support staff role with Rick when they won the national championship. So I mean, how similar is that to how he does things? I and mean, I think there's kind of an aura around, you know, Rick Pitino for being meticulous, for doing things a certain way. And, you know, whether you like it or don't like it, regardless of how you feel about the problems that they had at the program, you know, he wins basketball games. Yeah, yeah he does so much more than that. He does so much more than that. And, and I mean, I, I, you know, whatever happened, happened. I hated to see what happened. Working for him for three years. I always tell people it would be it's the basketball equivalency of somebody going to business school, going to Wharton. Uh, if you want to be a lawyer, going to Yale, it's it's a crash course. And he he is such a sharp, sharp basketball mind. First and foremost, that being said, are there teams that maybe run better stuff or have whatever, whatever, whatever? The day-to-day running of the program, handling the players, motivating the guys, there's nobody better. I have always said, and, and the part that, that I hated so much to see was it was the high profile, you know, the, the, and I'm not, I don't want to get into specific, but like the Brian Bowen deal, the kid was a top 10, 15 player in the country, whatever, whatever. There's nobody. You give hardworking, overachieving type, hard-nosed kids, there's nobody in the history of basketball better than Coach P. My, and, and to just further my point, our 2013 team, all right, all right, Corey, who are the best teams in the country right now? It starts with Duke, right? For sure. Right? You say Duke. Um, who, who else is? Kansas, who else? Gonzaga. Kansas, Gonzaga, Kansas. How many pros does Duke have? We, they have three top five or six, picks, right? Right, probably another – Two guys who'll play in the NBA, maybe. I would say another two or they probably maybe six, three. Six pros. Delorier, maybe, yeah. Probably six eventual NBA. We won a national championship with one pro who hasn't even become a, a, a consistent starter. Gorgie James, the only pro on that. Montrez Harrell was a freshman on the team. He scored two points the whole final four weekend. They were the most memorable two points, but he only scored two points. Go find another team. And I know Villanova has done some really good things lately. But at that point in college basketball, we had the, we had the best defense in the history of Ken Palm at that point uh, that went back like 15 or 18 years, something like that. And you talk about squeezing every single ounce of talent out of guys. That's Coach P. Like he gets guys. And, you know, to be honest, and dealing with the players there, it was honesty too. Hey, guys, you may not always like what he has to say, but what the older guys started to understand, there was a method to the madness. And the guys who bought in and the guys who wanted to be part of the program and they wanted to wear Louisville across their chest, those guys had great careers. And, I mean, I can't tell you how incredible a guy like Peyton Siva was and how integral he, he was to that national championship. And it wasn't just the points, the assists. The, obviously, he was an incredible defender. That wasn't it with him. It was the day-to-day leading the guys. You know, freshman gets yelled at, hanging his head, has a bad day. Peyton goes over there and picks him up. And, and those kinds of guys are the ones that, that made – and Coach P would tell you this. Coach P is not Coach P without the Peyton Stevens of the world, without guys like Wayne Turner, who we had at Kentucky, without a guy like Travis Ford, who was just the ultimate overachiever. Those guys – made Coach P, and those are the kind of guys who were going to thrive under him. You know, again, but from a it, from a staff perspective, there's there's certainly a lot of talk about you know Coach P's coaching tree. How many guys have gone on? You know, you've got the Willards, you've got Mick Cronin, you Mick, got uh, Bill sure, Donovan, well, Ralph Willard, Billy. Uh, I'm going down the line. Marvin at uh, at UNLV. I mean, go down the line. It's Jim O'Brien, Massiello, like. 
it, it's incredible. It's incredible. But what the the thing is, the thing is, people people always talk about, you know, if, if you go there for a couple of years, you're going to have a chance to be, you know, a really successful coach and get a job. But at the same time, you know, everyone who's ever worked from, they're going to tell you it's an incredibly demanding position that you had to go through. Yeah, like I said, it was like going to the Wharton School. It's like going to Yale Law. It's, it was. And I'm not saying this, pat myself on the back. I mean, there were multiple, multiple days where I may not come home for two or three days. You know, I might spend two or three consecutive nights in my office. You know, you'd work till midnight, 1 a.m., sleep for a few hours, be back up at 6 to have everything ready for him in the morning. And the amount of stats, video, this, the amount that he could consume and process was just unbelievable. He he wanted to every time if he was if coach was getting on uh, his his elliptical his arc trainer if he was getting on that like he wanted he'd come to me and he'd be like hey uh, let's pull every zone possession we've played from the last ten games every time the ball got to the nail let's let's put all those on one edit I want to watch it and it's like Whoo! so as I was there for longer I got a lot better in how to mark these things and my job became I could. I became a lot more efficient in doing it. But I'm going to tell you, that first year, it was a bear. And he would take it, and he could watch. he could get out of watching. This always blew my mind. I'd watch six, eight, ten games. He would watch one half of one game, and he'd come up with a lot of the same thoughts. It took me, you know, three days to come up with. And I'd just be like, man, this dude, he's a different, he's a different guy. He could, he could watch one zone offense at it, and he'd be like, all right, let's just, you know what, hey. This game, let's let's just tweak the zone a little bit. Let's do this, this, and this. He'd say, what do you think about this press? Uh, pull up some clips of them playing against something similar to it, yada, yada. And he, his game planning and not only taking teams out of their strengths, but also exploiting weaknesses is second to none. And that's why, like, he had the absurd stat, uh, I think, going like, – in the first round of the NCAA tournament, and then in the Sweet 16 round, when you have you know five days to prepare, at one point he was like uh, some absurd, like 28 and two. Uh, he'd never lost in the Sweet 16 until we got beat on a really, really tough couple whistles the UK, and we led the whole game up in Indianapolis. Like it, giving him time to prepare a team to play a game. I'm gonna tell you, I, I almost felt bad for other teams. He, he, he was, it was it was it was unbelievable. I mean, his ability to well, if you take if you take the technological advances of something like synergy and as detail oriented as you can be in breaking down film now, and you combine that with somebody with that type of mind, it's gonna pay huge dividends against the, you know some of the coaching staffs that aren't as film oriented. There's no doubt. There's no doubt. If you can it, get the kids to do it, and. Well, it, it, right. It, you, you just you just hit the nail on the head. None of it matters. None of it matters if we can watch film until we're blue in the face. But it, the key is how much do the guys understand? And, and he has an incredible ability. He could connect with Gorgie Jang was from Senegal, Montrez Harrell from Tarboro, North Carolina, uh, David Levitt, one of our walk-ons, grows up uh, on on land in Oldham County and comes from a very you know affluent family. And he could connect to all these guys and get through to all of them. And and that's I'm gonna tell you, you don't learn that. That's a talent. And I, I might might say I always uh, when people ask me about Coach B, I always kind of gave him this example. If you were on a deserted island of a hundred people, one way or another, he would just rise to the top because he just has incredible natural charisma and leadership capabilities. And he talked. He actually came down. Uh, late September, early October, he was in Louisville and he talked to our guys and 17 guys. I mean, you've never seen, they look like freaking bobbleheads. He's saying stuff to them, trying to get them going and their heads are just, I mean, these guys, they never took their eyes off of him and they, he just has an incredibly captivating, if you've ever seen him speak, like he, he's, he's incredible. And, and I, I think some of that gets passed down to the assistants who have gone on. Uh, some, but a lot of that's just him. The one thing he always told me, he'd say, you know, we do so many things well here. And he would say this to every assistant when they were leaving to get a head job. He'd say, 
you know, you need to take the things that we do well here and, and do them to the best of your ability. Also, find the things that you can't do because of staff limitations, because of talent limitations, whatever. He'd say, stay away from them. This is not perfect. It's perfect for us. And, and that's the one thing that I think my dad has done such a good job in Bellarmine, and in though this is his 14th year, amazingly, is what we do and the way we do things. Like we've led the nation all three divisions in field goal percentage five in the last seven years, which is an absurd stat. Like we've shot over 52.5% each year for the last seven years. Uh, what we do is perfect for us. It's not, it doesn't mean you can just take this and go do it in another program and it's going to work. It, 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 everything, and I've always talked to everybody in college basketball that I said, I know for everything you do in your program has to work kind of in synergy from the way you lift to the way you practice to the way your sports medicine people operate to how your class schedules operate. Everything, so it's certainly to how you recruit. All of that has to go into it, 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 and it's not. It's why it's so hard to cookie cutter programs. You can't just say, "Hey, well, hell, what we're doing at Bellarmine is perfect." You know what? I'm going to up and move this to to Murray State. It, it's not going to be the same. You got to your your team has to fit your school, your your staff has to fit your team, and ultimately, we got to find ways. Our, our number one job is to get the most that we can out of the guys and put the guys in the best, the best possible positions for them to succeed, ultimately elevating the program. That's the whole goal. I mean, and it's, and it's very difficult and that's why coaching is much more of an art than a science. And that all makes, that all makes sense. And that's exactly again, why you guys have been successful, but you know, we wanted to talk today about recruiting during the season, how it goes on with college programs. You know, again, this podcast is kind of about educating people and, to do what you just talked about, at the end of the day, the number one thing, you have to get the guys that fit your personality for all of those core values. And that's ultimately going to be the only way you can win. You're going to be able to change some guys to an extent when you take over a program, but you got to get your guys. So when you look at things during the season and there's so much going on, you know, whether you're at Louisville and you're, you're doing all this film work, whether you're at Bellarmine and you're an assistant and you're, you know, have guys that you're actually recruiting personally, you know, how as a staff do you guys handle recruiting during the season? Well, I, I think the first thing you said was so spot on about you got to get, it's not getting the quote unquote best players in a one-on-one -on -one tournament, right? We don't play one-on-one. -on -one. It's getting the guys that fit your system. And I'm going to tell you who does as well of a job, it does as good of a job as anybody in America is a guy you know really well is Nick. I mean, you talk about like, there, there's a Bearcat type, right? For sure. And, and, and you, know, you go, you can look at a guy like, uh, I mean, going back, Yancey Gates, um, I mean, he, 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 and, and I know he didn't even play under Mick, but like when I think of a, a, a UC basketball player, the first guy that pops in my mind is Eric Hicks, right? Kenny Martin. Oh, Eric Hicks. Under K Mart. Okay. Yeah. Kenny Martin, Eric Hicks. These dudes who are just tough as nails. And, and, and Mick, Mick hasn't deviated, right? He stayed like, hey, man, this is working. What, you been to eight straight tournaments now? Is that right? Seven? I, eight? I, sounds right. It's, it's a good amount. Whatever it is. I know there's only like, eight or nine programs in the country that have been to uh, as many in a row, which is incredible. And it's not, it's not, you know, it, everybody has a bad year, right? Kentucky's going to have a bad year. I mean, in Arizona, gonna, uh, Kansas, like all these teams can have a down year and mix just right there, just every year, you know, exactly what you're getting. It, and and it, it reminds me of something that uh, in my time with coach Mack, and this is the number one thing I took from him. And I've tried to always keep in mind everywhere I've been, he used to always say, and this, this is brilliant, I think this, this really ties into recruiting. I think it's really important in recruiting. Coach Mack used to always say that, like, and at the time we were in the A-10, that every team in the league, every team in your conference should say the same things about you, you know, the first three bullet points. And, you know, if you're playing a, a Cincinnati, everybody knows, hey, man, you're not getting in the lane. They're going to rebound on both ends. And they're going to out-tough you the entire game. Like, everybody everybody knows that. Like, that's who they are. That's why there's been consistency within the program. With us, They're not going to make a jump shot. Might be number four on that. Well, <laughs> those are your words. The, the, <laughs> for us, 
for us, we've hung our hat on a few things. One, we're going to play incredibly hard. Like we're going to play incredibly hard. We're going to be incredibly unselfish. And we're going to, we're going to take the best shots possible. Now where I think we turned it, that's what everybody would say about us. And that it rubs me a little bit the wrong way because we've led the, we've led our league in field goal percentage defense four years in a row. So not only are we leading the nation in field goal percentage offense, we've been number one in the league four years in a row. So we've tried to evolve. And that's, I think, in, in like you say, in, in recruiting, we've tried to evolve. So we found our strengths. We never, ever, ever going to back off of our strengths. We're going to keep, we want to be the best we can be at what we're good at. But we also do want to shore up the other things. And, well, let me let me interrupt you real quick. It's it's interesting, you know, in the way you guys evaluate because we were watching a kid play in July. You and I were, and uh, Bo might have been there too. And you asked me what I thought, and I said I think the kid's good enough. I I think that he doesn't shoot it well enough for what you guys recruit. And you told me you're like that's kind of a misconception because we're going to be able to get guys, you know, your father's very good at getting guys to buy in so much that even if you're not a great shooter, number one, you're going to have four years to work at it. But number two, you're going to teach them what is such a good shot for them that the field goal percentage is going to take care of itself. And, you know, that's got to be how you guys have achieved what you've achieved statistically. Uh, uh, Yes. (laughs) Yes. On so many fronts. So I think that the most, I really do believe this. I think the single most important thing in recruiting Number one, you're not just evaluating athleticism, right? We're evaluating attitudes and character, and you're trying to project. That's why it's hard. You're trying to project what a 16-year-old's going to look like when he's 21, right? I mean, at the end of the day, like that's pretty much what we're doing, and that's not very easy to do. We, what we, in order for any any player, any high school kid to get to the top of their, to maximize their ability, which is our goal, right? As a coach, that's your goal is, is you want to get this kid to 110% of his ability in order to, they can't do that. If you're constantly fighting discipline problems, fighting attitude issues, fighting academic issues, our guys got to take care of that stuff so that we can work with them on their basketball. And the one thing I'll say for us, and I hope it, I hope this stays the same. We have had, and this is my third year back, we've had so few days, I mean, I could count them on less than one hand, where the primary concern in any practice is anything other than getting better at basketball. Right? And that's not the case. But here's the thing. Here's, 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 Here's the thing. You just told me about all these guys that you've got that are sons of coaches or even if they're not sons of coaches, they come from really good high school programs. And what that's going to do is as you get, you know, more and more years into this in your program, you're going to have guys that self-police. And, you know, when you have guys that self-police, that's a thousand times better than as a coach having to get upset and get on a guy and go through all that crap. When you have that self-policing, that that's how you win games. And, you know, that's, I think one of the challenges that maybe, you know, sometimes a Duke or Kentucky goes through, you know, going back to Coach Patino, he was having more three and four year guys at Louisville. And, you know, that's going to solve a lot of that problem and maybe why he won a national championship with having, you know, one maybe fringe NBA starter. No, you're no, you're 100 percent right. I mean, you if if we, we try to establish a culture and I shouldn't say we my father has worked for 14 years to get this culture where it is. And I would put it up against anyone in college basketball it, at any level. Our juniors and seniors are so bought into the program. And we remind them every single day that all we can do as coaches is guide them and point them in the right direction, right? It's, it's their team. It's their season. It's their career. And everything that they do, we talk about choices. That's what we, All we talk about is choices. That everything in, in your life, as a result of a choice or an action that you made. There's no external factor. Now, do things happen to people that's totally out of their control? Absolutely. But every day, they can choose to come to the gym with the right attitude, with the desire to get better, with the – they can choose to help their teammates. And that ultimately, it all comes back on them. Now, we, we can absolutely guide them and point them in the right direction. But without them – We've got no shot. It has to. It has to start from the guys. And the only way to do that, I'm gonna tell you, 
the only way to do that is recruiting. You have to have the right kind of guys. And right now, I mean, the attitudes in our locker room are incredible. And when you have all these guys that are maximizing their ability, right, they're actually getting to 100% of their ability, you're going to get so much more out of the group as a whole because everybody's kind of kind of the, the – the, the the high tide rises all ships or whatever that saying is the rising tide whatever you know what i mean and and that's kind of the the attitude is the tide and when everybody everybody's bought in and you're not fighting egos or agendas or this guy wants to wants to come out and yeah he's never worn an arm sleeve in his life but all of a sudden on game night he needs to wear this arm sleeve so he can get some attention for himself that doesn't fly because it's not about them. And that's our whole deal. Is that it's not about you. It's about us. And it's worked really well for us. Again, I'm not saying it's perfect everywhere. And there's a thousand different ways to skin a cat. But this is what's worked really well for us. And I got, you were talking about, and we do have the reputation of shooting the ball really well. I'm going to read off. I just pulled this up on my laptop. This is in order of points scored, right? I'm looking at our season box from last year so. First kid on top of the list, uh, he averaged 17 a game. He shot – these are field goal percentages, okay, not three, just field goal. 57, 59, 65, 47, 53, 42, 48, 50, 52. That's our top – oh, wait, and then the next one's 51. That's our top, whatever, eight or nine guys that just read off. Listen, Corey, they're good shooters. Good shooters don't make – uh, what was the highest guy I just read off? Good shooters don't make 56% of their shots, right? Who, who makes 66% of their shots? Guys who take Chris Shoemate, maybe? Chris Shoemate. Layups, dunks, great shot, <laughs> right? And I wish, I, I know Hoop Math does this for Division One schools, where you can, if you have never been on Hoop Math, it's Ken Palm, but they take everything. Uh, it's more for individual stats, I think. They take everything from uh, off the play-by-play and the algorithm they've built. And you can see, uh, it used to be one of my favorite scouting numbers at UofL, you can see what percentage of a kid's field goal makes, what percent of his buckets come off of assists. Well, I'm going to tell you this. A guy that shoots 66% from the field and averages 11 points a game, I'm going to tell you 90% uh, – well, now he had some – Right. Offensive <laughs> rebounder too. But that guy, that guy is putting – all of his are coming off of drive, drop off, dunk, right? Right. I mean, that's how you're going to score if you're shooting. Six. Oh, of listen, course. Of listen, course. Listen, that's a product of being a great teammate, right? And and we don't. We would certainly never belittle a guy for shooting 65. percent We'll also make sure that guy knows that hey, without the other four guys on the team, you ain't shooting 65. percent Well, let me let me ask you this then: when when that's the culture you guys have built, I mean, whether it's before the season starts or, you know, specifically right now, because we're kind of trying to talk about the winter, how important is it for you to get kids on campus, you know, on game day? What are you trying to involve them in in game day to kind of show them that, you know, this is something that you can be a part of? It's, it's so hard. It's something that we absolutely want to do. It's something that, you know, at our level, Corey, we're not recruiting freshmen, right? We just we don't have enough manpower, but we will now. We start catching wind of sophomores, and, and, and the and here's the hardest part for us. I'm not hopping especially on locally. You guys, I'm not you guys do recruit part. fairly locally. We do. I mean, most of our roster is. I mean, what two hundred miles? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right now, our entire roster is the state of Kentucky, Knoxville. Uh, obviously, you know, we have our Northern Kentucky Cincinnati kids up to Columbus, across Columbus. to Indianapolis, and then we have one from about an hour north of Indy, and then down to Evansville. Well, Columbus Columbus would be the furthest, and that's less than 200 miles probably. Yes. Yeah. yeah, it's I think it's like right at 170, 180 miles. And, and that's – we don't we, – we have one transfer who's from Florida. We knew him through, you know, friends of friends, and, and but that transfers are a little different because obviously you're not evaluating them during the season. You have to get out and see them in person. And we love seeing kids with our high school team. You see them play within the system. You see them play in front of crowds and games that usually mean a little more. And, and, and like we put a ton of stock 
on how they perform with their high school team. I'll give you an excellent example. Plus, I mean, with your with to, to to cut you off real quick, with your dad and then even yourself, especially if it's in Louisville, you guys are going to have a relationship with the high school coaches to get all the information Absolutely. you want anyway, the real Absolutely. details. And, and you say ahead, in man. Louisville, but right now, I'm going to tell you, Corey, by next year we're going to more Cincinnati kids in Northern Kentucky. Yeah, you got to – no, absolutely, absolutely. You, know, you guys have mentioned a lot in Cincinnati without question. And, 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 but, but that's because we've developed – I think we have a good reputation up there. There's, for, one coach, there's one coach who is a pretty big Facebook guy whose son played for you. Yeah. And if anybody doesn't know, his name is Joseph Frederick. So, <laughs> I mean, you guys – yeah, you guys got – he's a podcast alum. Oh, um, yeah. So, you oh, know, yeah. that certainly helps. So, so the list I'm now on is long and distinguished. That's great. The but we've and it's why it's it's why Corey, you have to be honest in recruiting, right? You can't bring kids in, sell them a bill of goods, and they get here and you've turned everything on its head, and then the kid leaves. That that's no good. That's not that's not good for the kid. It's not good for us. So what we try to do, we're very upfront. We love like it's a big deal for us. We want to involve the high school coach in every recruitment, right? Like we've got to keep them involved. They have a they have a much they have more time with the kid. They've usually been with the player for four years. We want the high school coach involved. We want it makes to, sense. I mean, when you when I'm going to tell you with the way we get off of the with, with such yeah. a program oriented deal, we want kids that are bought into the program. And you know, you get a kid like CJ Fleming. I mean, there's never been anybody more bought into a program. Than CJ Fleming, right? I mean, obviously his dad is. I'm going to tell you this. I've seen a lot of high school practices, been to a lot of high school games. It, it you you talk about squeezing every ounce of ability out of players. Like there's nobody, there's no high school coach in America who's going to do a better job than, than Coach Fleming. There's some on the. Same I've never level. told my. I've never told my favorite Flem story. Um, I'd love to hear CJ. That. Absolutely. I was at one of their early practices when CJ was an eighth grader and he would come over after school and he would, you know, hop in with the varsity a little bit here and there. And there was a division one head coach in there. And as an eighth grader, CJ dives head first into the metal bleachers <laughs> to save a ball. OK, he lands in the bleachers. I thought for sure he's dead. Like, let's call the ambulance. Let's you know make the funeral arrangements like he's gone. And he's just laying practice? in the bleachers. Oh, no, just wait. <laughs> so the ball goes down on the other end. So it's five on four and they score. And Flem stops the practice like CJ's bleeding. And he goes, are you going to get up and play or do I have to make a sub? Just that calm. <laughs> no, no big deal. Like they're just So, I mean, Flem, it doesn't get any crazier than Flem. No. And he's, and he's the best. No, he is. But I, I'm going to tell you, man, CJ Fleming comes in. He's first, you know, workout, first day of practice, like, it would be hard for a kid to be more college ready, not necessarily, and they all, all their skills have to improve, the speed of the game, but as far as competing, there's nobody, nobody, and, and, and to be, Parker, the other kid who played for his dad, him and CJ are cut from the exact same cloth, like, Parker's dad, I love Coach Jenny, he's one of my, one of my favorite people I've ever been around, he's a lunatic. And there's nothing we can say to Parker, nothing we can yell at him that he hadn't already heard for about 16 years. So he's good to go. And these guys, they are so ready to compete, and they set the culture. You know, the players set the culture. We don't. We try to establish, we try to create an environment in which you can thrive, but they're going to set it. And, and, and like today, we had the, uh, just a, a, a weird scheduling deal. We actually had 10 days between games. We played last. We played this Wednesday, last Wednesday, and we don't play again until the Saturday after Thanksgiving. I don't know when this is going to drop, but so this Saturday at the end of the week. Well, it gave us a chance. We actually gave the guys what my dad will tell you was three days off. We actually had individuals Friday. He counts that as a day off because all they had was individuals and lifting. And then we gave them Saturday off. We had individuals Sunday night, which he'll tell you was also off because they had until 6 p.m. off. So. He counts it as three days. The guys counted as one. We had a we had them all in. So they actually this is it probably as as well rested as they'll be until March. And yesterday, yeah, yesterday was Sunday. Yesterday morning, 
I live right by campus. I walk by the gym and CJ and Ben Wire, another Northern Kentucky kid, at like 9 a.m. on a Sunday morning, they're in the gym shooting. And these guys, they're just cut different, man. Like, they love ball. They love each other. They certainly love winning and competing. And, and, and when you guys are doing that, and, and not only are they going to the gym, they're bringing teammates with them on their own. You know, we don't have to always be the bad guy, right? They're doing it themselves. Like, they don't need us always on them. Now, during individuals, practice, film, yeah, absolutely, we're going to run the show. But these guys have proven, like, because the culture's right. Well, I, I, Corey, I'll, I'll give you, so in the preseason, we listed at 7 a.m. five days a week. The captains decided, like, hey, man, let's just take care of this. And, and 7 a.m. is going to mean 6.45, shoes tied in our, in our turf room where they warm up. And every single day, we had one kid who absolutely panicked, flipped out. He's one of the best students in the entire university. He showed up three minutes late because he slept through his alarm. That was the only issue we had in an entire preseason. That was it. And to be honest with you, when he came, we laughed at him. We weren't even mad because everybody he would never do it on purpose. When it, the, the culture is, is, so, is so good in the locker. And the guys care about each other so much. and They care for each other. And they all believe in common goals. And, and it's, man, it, it's been incredible. And, 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 you know, you put 17 guys in a room. Listen, we got guys from different backgrounds. We got uh, one guy uh, from far western Kentucky, Skylar Hunter, grew up on a corn, soybeans, rice, and something else. He grew up on, like, 1,200 acres. He, they're, they're commercial farmers. Um, Chavarsky Corbett is from a very rough area in Tampa, single-parent home. And you put them all together, and man, I'm gonna tell you, these guys love each other, and they have so much fun together, and and it's so much fun to see. And you watch these young guys that come in at 17, 18 years old, and when you see them at 20, 21, like it is, it's incredible, and it's so much fun to be a part of. Well, that's great. It's, it's, you know, it's fun to hear that enthusiasm. That's one of the great things, you know, about Division Two basketball is you, you. And even, you know, non-high major, mid-major, low-major, I think is the same thing where you can just build this type of culture. And, you know, the guys are are as much of an integral part of recruiting as anything. I'm going to tell you, my, my, it's, it's been my dad has said it until he's blue in the face. And we all kind of – we've all heard it so many times, but it, it's, it's 100% the truth. Our best recruiters are our players. And, and we've had guys come on campus, and the guys have said, you know, eh, I don't know about this one. And it's like, okay, done. Not a problem. Like – Okay, it's over. And, and, and conversely, we've had guys come on campus, and you know our visits are usually Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday. Saturday they leave during the day, and and it'll be Friday night. And I got a text at like you know eleven thirty from one of our juniors or seniors, and I'm like, oh my god, what's going on? And, and you get it, and it's like, hey man, make sure we get him. And I'm like, okay, well hey man, why don't you do your part? <laughs> you make sure we get him. And, and usually once we get those kinds of texts, we know the kid's coming. And, and the I other got, thing is, the ahead. other thing is, you know, you have in a lot of Cincinnati guys, you have in a lot of Louisville yeah. guys, you know, if yeah. you recruit another Columbus guy, they're, they're going to already know them. I mean, they're, yeah. they're big cities, yeah. but they're not. So, no, they're not. you know, if, if, if you had a kid other, 2021, yeah, if he comes down to visit next year, four or five kids on the roster are going to know him. No doubt. No doubt. And, and, you know, that's part of it, man. Corey, like, we don't need to branch out. We're not recruiting kids from Nevada, right? We don't need to. There's plenty of, of good basketball players. Like you said, about 200 miles. You know, I, and that's probably if you if you took a, a if you drew a, a circle a circular type shape, kind of the whole state of Kentucky. You know, we have one from Knoxville um, who actually played for for one of my former teammates. Um, there, and then you draw a circle to Columbus, Indianapolis maybe go as far west as St. Louis. We've had St. Louis kids. And, and then you come back over. And that's, that, listen, this is basketball, all right? It's not football. We, we don't sign 27 guys a year, right? We're signing four or five. And, and if you can't find four or five hard-nosed dudes who want to be part of the program in that area, and by the way, Bellarmine is a great place to go to school, right? It, it, it's, it's in a, the best neighborhood in the entire city. It's in a, it's in a good city. We have incredible support. Season tickets are sold out. There's a waiting list. Like, academically, it's very good. We have a lot of things to sell. 
And then when you put our guys and our program on top of it, it, it I, I mean, I, as a guy who played there, I'm going to tell you it's a hell of a place to play. Like it's a very if if you're not if you're not going to go. The one thing, Corey, I, 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 you and I have talked about this, and it's something that I, I invite every uh, parent, high school coach, AAU coach. The one thing that nobody talks about to these guys when they're coming up is they're you know juniors and seniors. They've got to understand college basketball is a long season, and, and if you think the only thing that should be your determining fact, your deciding factor, is going to the highest level, you're making the, the highest possible level you can make. Listen, if if it, it, I'll, I'll give you just if you can go to an ACC school that went two and sixteen in the league last year, or you could go to a, a, a Belmont, you're going to have a whole lot more fun at Belmont, right? Where you're going to go sixteen and two in the league, and you're competing to win. You're playing to win something, and, and that's the one thing I tell every kid: like, hey man, go first off. You got to go where where you feel comfortable with your teammates. Because at the end of the day, our guys, like I was with our guys, everybody had individuals this morning, that's 40 minutes. We had film before practice, that's 15 minutes. We were on the court for about an hour 50 today. So that's two and a half hours we're with them, right? Or almost, almost three hours we're with them. Guess who they're with the other 21 hours out of the day? Well, eight of them, they sleep. So now we're down to 13. Well, most of our guys, well, they all live with a basketball player. So they're going to be with them when they wake up in the morning. They're going to eat their meals together because typically their meals revolve around what time they have individuals or lifting or practice, right? They're going to, most of our guys, if you have the same major as another teammate, you're probably in classes together because we don't have that many classes offered time-wise, and your classes have to revolve around the practice schedule. You're literally with a teammate. Almost every waking minute of, of your day for seven months a year. So if you don't like your teammates and you don't get to know your teammates and their, your future teammates in the recruiting process or the future guys who are going to be signing with you, you're, you're making a big mistake. And that's the one thing that I encourage. Ask questions. Get to know, get to know what the program's actually like on a day-to-day basis. Not like you asked how important is it to get into a game. Corey, I want every single kid we recruit to see a home game in Knights Hall. I'd love for them to come see a sellout. We have great student support. It's a hell of an environment. And that's awesome. And that helps us sell. That, that sells us to recruits, right? That's great. What I also want them to do, I want them to come down. And we always, always, always try to get every kid. If there's a day when, even if it's a young kid, it's like a junior and they don't they have an end service day or it's a school holiday, something like that, or if they can just take a college visit, come down, see what a day is like. See what, see what October 18th is like in the Bellroom basketball program. See our guys, individuals in the morning grab lunch with them, whatever, see them that, that, well, we can't pay for lunch for junior, but you know what I mean? See, see what a day is like to see an individual, see a practice. It's, it's the biggest thing, Corey, that I, I, I want every single kid in the recruiting process to understand. We had, I think 94 practices last year, right? We had uh, two years ago, maybe last year we had like 89 or 90. We played 30 games or whatever, 32 games. You better see practice, right? That's the day-to-day reality of it. And if you don't like what you see in practice, Absolutely. if you don't like what you see in practice, you probably shouldn't go there because that's what your life is going to be. You're going to have 350 to 400 practices in your college career. Well, you're only playing 120 games. So, so what's more important here? And, and, and that's, like, that's just the one thing that I, I would tell every single young kid that, hey, man, like, you're going to get recruited. You're going to see different things. You can see bells and whistles. And some schools might have flashier weight rooms. We're about to put over a quarter million dollars in our locker room, and I, I feel very confident it will be by far the best in America at our level. Not even close. And that stuff's great, but that doesn't win games. It doesn't. Like, we're trying to do that because we believe in taking care of our guys. Our guys give us so much. We, we try to raise money to give back to them. But that's not going to win games. It doesn't. Practice wins games. Recruiting wins games. The culture wins games. And, 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 and if guys aren't willing – to take to come watch practice as a recruit, it's hard for me to take them seriously. You know what I mean? No, absolutely, it makes perfect and, sense. And, 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 and I know I, we, we've we've talked about this like a hundred times, and we, we haven't answered the question. You asked about getting out to see kids in the winter. We would love to see every single kid with their high school team. Unfortunately, it's not always possible. Our top guys, we will do everything in our power to get up there to see them. Our signees, 
the guys who have, the, we're going to announce signing of, of three. When's it going to drop, Corey? Uh, tomorrow or Wednesday. Okay, well, here's the deal. We've already received the letter, so I'll just tell you. We got three letters of intent. Uh, the last one came in today. All three kids from the Cincinnati, Northern Kentucky area. Like, we will be at the first game of their season that we can possibly make it. Right? Meaning we don't have a game conflict or we're on the road or whatever. I think it's really, really important to go see them play with their high school team. Let them know that, that we support them, that we're all in on their season. Um, you know, we especially like in where it gets really hard is in the postseason. We're prepared when we're preparing for postseason. Uh, maybe we're already into our postseason. You've got high school postseason going on. We're still going to do everything in our power to get up there to see them because it's important to us that the that the, the, the signees understand they're already part of our family, right? And we're going to do everything in our power to 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 follow them, to be there for them. Hopefully, to go give them a high five after win, give them a hug after loss. That's really important. There's nothing more important than than making sure your players know how much you care about them. And the only way for them to know that is, is you can't talk about it. You got to show it. And and I wish, Corey, I wish we could see every single kid. I hate watching film of recruits. I really do because I'm I'm very bad at evaluating what the game's like on film. I think it's really hard. Yeah, you know, I, I wish I could. I wish we had private jets and we could go shoot over all the play, shoot all over the place to see kids play. Um, the, the key, and I know we had we had touched on this before the the show. You said like fly into the hoop. That's awesome. Fly into the hoop's awesome because we can go see a bunch of kids in one day, right? Uh, King of the Bluegrass here is big for us. Any opportunity we get where we might be able to go see three or four recruits all in one day. Uh, is worth its weight in gold because time is so valuable, as you know. Time is so valuable during the season. Well, let and, me let me ask you one last one last question here. Um, you know, before we before we wrap it up with with this, I think the hardest thing in recruiting a lot of times in terms of like a quick conversation with a kid is after their high school game, whether they lost, whether they won, all type of people are trying to get to them. You know, what do you? talking about not kids that you've signed but kids that you're going to recruit you're interested in you went to evaluate what do you try and get through to them in the two to maybe 10 minutes you have with them after that game yeah, it's not 10 minutes the, I, <laughs> yeah probably two to five minutes really. yeah the, the first thing i i always want to ask them a question right and, and usually it's about the same question like hey man you know glad we can make it um how did you think it went and and the guys who I'm always curious to get their take. Is it we did this, we did this, we did this, or is it I had some things go against me, I had this, I had that. Because at the end of the day, like I hate I it drives me nuts when somebody sees a kid play one game and he makes some shots. Like, oh, he's a great shooter. Well, like, that's ridiculous, man. You got to see a kid play 15 times before you know if he's a really good shooter because it, you gotta, you've got to get a larger sample size. What I want to know is how do they feel about their team, right? Like, I, I went up, uh, I might have been his first game of the year, I think, when CJ was a, was a senior. It was, either first, it, was, it was early in the season, and I went up, and really he did not have a very good night. And it was actually, it was actually the worst I, I saw him play in high school. And I said, you know, I grabbed after the game. I said, you doing all right? And he was like, he said, you know, he said, I, I really just wasn't very good. But, and he immediately turned to all the teammates and he said, Hey man, like Riley did this and this happened. And he said, you know, if and I got, and these are, he's a 17 year old kid. And he said, you know, he said, if we just play really, really hard, everything else will take care of itself. And I wanted to just give the kid a hug. Like, <laughs> like kid, you're damn right. Like, play hard. It's the only – if coaches want – I would just want kids who compete and, and, and legitimately compete, not pound their chest and, and make sure everybody's looking at them. Like, I'm not really into all that. Like, are you really going to dig in when things are good and when things are bad? If a guy 
I, I'll tell you, Corey, one of the things I really like to see is when a kid gets taken out of a game. How's his body language? Is he the kind of guy who puts a towel over his head and goes to the end of the bench and sulks and kind of, you know, the look at me, look at me approach? Or is he the guy who comes out of the game and, and he's standing up, cheering on his teammates? Like, that means a lot to us because there's only five guys on the court, right? Like, right now, we got 12 sitting on the bench. And those 12 better be engaged. And I, I do think we have the best bench in college basketball. And I don't mean best in the way Monmouth does their choreographed dances. I'm telling you, like, our guys are legitimately thrilled for each other. Last year, we played one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten guys. Uh, between 17 and 27 minutes. It's really nine guys. One guy only played in like seven games. So we're going to run guys in quick, right? Everybody's going to run. You play as hard as you can. You're going to come back out. How, so, how much can you support your teammates? Like that means so much. And that's why, Corey, and, and, and there's, there's definitely a place for summer ball. Because, like we said, it's very difficult for us to see multiple kids in one day during the season. Summer ball is great because in one weekend, I can go see, what, 50, 100 kids, you know, whatever. I mean, I can go and I can drive to Indy or Cincinnati or, or uh, Atlanta, and you can literally see 100 prospects in one weekend. And that's awesome. But I think you get to know their character even better during the high school season, right? You get to see how involved they are with their team. You get to, you just see how they react to kind of more hostile situations. And, and, and their body language, their attitude during games is probably almost even, it's probably even more important than how you talk to them after the game. And, and now, Corey, I will tell you something that, that I've done in the past, and I don't do it all the time, but like if, if there's a local kid that I've gotten calls on, but hey, man, this junior can play, you really need to see him, yada, yada, yada. And it's, say, it's you know, whatever, it's within an hour. A lot of times, I won't even tell the kid I'm coming. I don't want that kid playing to me. I don't. I don't need him to put up an act, right? I want to see how's he act when, when he doesn't know who's watching, because that's what I want to see. Does that make sense? No, oh, absolutely. Yeah, I mean that, that's that's what I'm all like. We just want to see guys being themselves and try to get the most accurate read you can on them. And, and I will tell you this: my father's my father's maybe greatest attribute as a head coach, and I think I think we do a lot of things really well. He is not afraid to say no to a kid. If he sees something he doesn't like, he doesn't care how many people tell him that kid's really good. If he doesn't like something about his attitude or his character or the way the kid carries himself, he, it, no. And, and listen, we've turned down some kids who are plenty talented enough before, and they may have gone off and, and had good careers somewhere else. We don't we don't dwell on it. It's not like it, it, we had this 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 like cardinal rule of recruiting at Xavier, uh, and I thought I've, I've always carried this with me in recruiting. We used to always say that if you miss out on a kid, it might beat you one night a year, right? Like, let's say we lose out on a kid to University of Indianapolis, you know, a conference rival of ours. Yeah, we might play them two times a year. So let's say we we, we miss out on a kid, it costs you two, it costs you twice in a year. You take the wrong kid, it can cost you thirty times a year. And and, and my dad, he never said it like that, but he's lived it, and, he, and he's shown it over and over and over. Nothing is more important to him than, than, than the culture, than the attitude, the character of the kid. And like I was telling you earlier, listen, a kid may not shoot at grade as a high school. That's not that big of a deal, okay? As long as he's willing to put in the work. Like, we do individuals year-round, or all school year, including during the season, right? Obviously, we don't have, we don't have summer access with them. But they're going to improve their shooting. And, and if, if they're the hard-working kind of kid that we want, Shooting is the easiest thing to improve. All it is is reps. Hey, man, we got a gun. Go in there. Fire it. Fire away, right? You're going to get better. Every day in individual, we're going to make sure you're shooting at the right tempo with the right footwork doing the right thing. That stuff doesn't turn us off. You have an attitude problem. You're a selfish kid. You're soft. Nah, we, we can't fix that. And my dad has no fear of just saying no. Like, nope, we're going to pass. We're not, we're, not, we're not involved with that. And, and we've taken heat with local kids that we've turned down. And, and, and you know what? It's worked out for us. And, and we have to trust his eye. And I think he has an incredible eye. He's always said the same thing, though. He is very, 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 very particular. He does not like watching kids on film. You know, obviously, if, there's, if that's the only way we can see him, that's what we're going to do. 
he, he wants to get eyes on the kid in person. We've got to be able to see him, see how they react to different situations. You have a much better gauge, I think, of their quickness, athleticism, everything in person than you do on film. And, and that, that's what we do. Like we're, he's going to, Bo and I, Felton, we will identify kids, we'll develop relationships with kids, but ultimately he's going to have the final set. And he, he, he trusts his own eye. I don't think he gets swayed by what other people say, which is really important. I think, I think nobody knows your program better than, than your own coaching staff. And I think it's been really good for us. Well, that's great. That's great. And that's a great, you know, recap. You also touched on some things that Chris Mack said. And, you know, like Coach Patino, one of the reasons that c is going to be successful at Louisville is he's very good at relating to kids. And, you know, he certainly has some recruiting mantras that work for him at Xavier. But one thing I hope that, you know, people who listen to this understand is we've had a lot of college coaches on the program or, you know, on this show, but, I don't think we've had anybody that has had the success in terms of consistent winning of 30 games in college basketball that you guys have had. So uh, definitely learned a lot about, um, you know, program building, recruiting within your culture, um, identifying the right guys and, you know, what you guys really look for in terms of things that go beyond basketball. So extremely informative. Um, Coach Davenport, thank you very much for coming on. Hey, Corey, now, you know, I'm going to be up there in Cincinnati. I got to see, I got three guys I got to touch on real early in the season so we'll have to get together. Well, I live very close to Moeller High School and um, Covington Catholic, Joe is family, and the other school I'm not far from either. So we'll that, be together, like, brother. That sounds good. And the beauty is uh, Moeller actually plays Cuffcast and East. So I'm hoping, and I don't know the exact date, but I'd love to get to both of them. That way I can I can kill two birds with one stone both days. That would be awesome. Molar Molar versus Cuff Cath, your boy Joe is fired up. So okay, yeah, it's it's high level. Well, I, I don't know. I love him. now here's the real deal. We may have to split up after the game. You're gonna talk to maybe you'll talk to uh the loser first. I got Joe. And I'll go get the win. Okay, you can get Joe. All right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Sounds good. All right, Corey. We'll be good, man. I appreciate you having me on. This is great. All right. Thanks, coach. All right. That was Doug Davenport, assistant coach of Bellerman. For Cor- I'm Corey Albertson for Jason Morrow. That was a triple double process. Triple double. I never get that right. That was the triple double podcast. Thanks, Doug. This podcast is brought to you by PlayEasy.com. For players, coaches, or casual athletes looking to book a sports facility, as well as owners and managers of sports facilities, PlayEasy.com is the new one-stop site for streamlined services. If you're looking for a place to practice, play, host your tournament, camp, or other, simply go to PlayEasy.com and create a booking request for your area. Your request will go out to surrounding facilities who respond with their best offer. Once you receive the offer that best fits your needs, book the facility and you're ready to play. For facility owners and managers, Play Easy puts the power in your hands to maximize the usage and visibility of your facility. Register your facility for free today at PlayEasy.com. PlayEasy.com is the booking site built by athletes, coaches, and facility managers, and is proud to help bring you the Triple Double Podcast. This podcast is also brought to you by Anigo Cleaning Systems. Are you tired of struggling in a dead-end job? If so, Anigo Cleaning Systems has what you're looking for, an opportunity to go into business for yourself, but not by yourself. With franchising opportunities available for as little as a $2,500 down payment, purchasing an Anigo franchise has never been easier. Once you own your Anigo franchise, you're licensed to clean commercial facilities all around the greater Cincinnati, Dayton, or Columbus areas with the support of Anigo sales, quality control, operational, and accounting staff. Call 513-332-0033 today for your opportunity to be your own boss and grow your own commercial cleaning company under the guidance of Anigo's proven and successful system. Again, call 513-332-0033 to learn more. With Anigo, your future starts today.